Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Finding Chemical Pollutants That Increase Breast Cancer Risk, A Detective Story. My name is Michelle Dixon, and I am the Program and Development Director for Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ruzanne Rudell. Ruzanne is the Research Director at Silent Spring Institute, where she leads major exposure and toxicology research programs, focusing on hormonally active chemicals and biological mechanisms by which chemicals may influence breast cancer. She leads a program to develop breast cancer-related chemical safety tests for green chemistry, and she also directs Silent Spring's Household Exposure Study, which has been described as the most comprehensive analysis to date of exposures in homes and is widely cited. She has served on the U.S. National Toxicology Program Board of Scientific Counselors, currently sits on the EPA's Chemical Science Advisory Panel, and is an adjunct research associate in Brown University School of Medicine. Ruthann, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and thanks to everybody who is uh, who's listening and or will be listening. I, I really like doing um, live talks because I like to see who's out there and you know make eye contact and all that. So um, I'm gonna have to just ima imagine you and, uh, and um, I hope that you can imagine uh, me here too. So uh, what I wanted to talk about and share with you is sort of uh, is the work that we've done over a couple decades now on trying to learn how, how do we identify chemical pollutants that affect breast cancer risk, that increase breast cancer risk? Um, how do we figure out which chemicals might do that? How do we figure out how to identify those chemicals so that people can make better uh, choices when they're um, picking um, products to buy and but also when they're manufacturing and choosing chemicals to put into their products. So, so that's, and, and I'm going to um, share that with you and I look, look forward to hearing your questions as well. Uh, for those who don't know, Silent Spring Institute was founded um, in the mid 90s in response to Mass Breast Cancer Coalition um, and many, uh, many women and um, physicians and environmental um, people with environmental interests who <clears throat> who identified, you know, were concerned about how many breast cancers were you know, being diagnosed and um, losing, you know, good friends and to the disease and wanting to know um, not just not just how to treat it, but also, um, you know, what's causing it and how can we prevent it. Uh, so today I was going to spend at least half of the time just talking about how do we try to understand what causes breast cancer and how things cause breast cancer. Uh, and so how can we identify chemicals that might increase breast cancer risk? And and then in the second half, how are we exposed to these chemicals and how can we reduce our risk? Uh, so scientists have a lot of um, different tools and use different you know, um, strategies to try to look at patterns and infer from those patterns um, something about the underlying phenomenon or what's going on. And in this case, you know, if you the question to to ask answer the question about whether breast cancer is inherited or environmental, uh, the um, this is an interesting study that 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 looked at many many sets of twins and the co-occurrence of, of breast cancer and other cancers uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But for breast cancer, you know, it looked like a large proportion of the um, of the risk is not due to inherited genes, um, including BRCA. So, so the question is, well, what, what are these other factors? Um, and there have been um, a variety of sort of hormonal factors and carcinogens that we know influence breast cancer risk, increased risk, ionizing radiation, 
has been discovered, um, you know, to to uh, increase risk of breast cancer through studying victims uh, of the atomic bombings and also uh, studying medical radiation use. Um, reproductive history, so these are hormonal factors that uh, really influence your, your age at menarche or menopause and your uh, number of pregnancies and lactation history. So those are all characteristics of your hormonal, hormonal uh, sort of internal environment. Pharmaceutical hormones also uh, very influential on breast cancer risk. So hormone replacement therapy, diethylstilbestrol, tamoxifen, oral contraceptives. Um, body size and lack of physical activity have been associated with breast cancer risk, alcohol intake, and tobacco smoke. So these are, these are the very well established um, observations from studying humans. And what's important to sort of think about when we think about environmental exposures is, um, well, it is, these, these factors here are, um, are factors that it was easy to, um, relatively easy for a person to self-report. Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, yes, I smoked or I didn't smoke or I drank about this much or I had this many, uh, you know, uh, x-rays or this kind of treatment of ionizing radiation. And so, but with most environmental exposures, people can't self-report. People don't know what the exposures are. And that makes it much, much more difficult to uh, figure out what um, what is the uh, association between the exposure and the breast cancer. So um, we are, I'm going to talk about today about how, how we learn, how we use other tools essentially to try to make predictions <coughs> and how we learn, we take what we can learn from these factors and how does alcohol cause breast cancer? How does tobacco smoke cause breast cancer or ionizing radiation? and say, well, what can we infer from that about how other chemicals might also cause breast cancer? Um, this is a table that summarizes some um, data about um, uh, more specifically, specific sort of environmental chemical exposures that have been studied in humans. And then I'm going to later on show the same slide uh, with the animal evidence alongside and um, to look at the consistency between humans and uh, experimental animals. But the, um, the first, uh, the ones in red are, have the strongest evidence in humans, so that's hormone replacement therapy, uh, oral contraceptives, diethylstilbestrol, ionizing radiation, alcohol, solvents, so that could be like paint strippers, um, and, uh, some like uh, spot spot removers, former dry cleaning solvents, and DDT from early life exposure. So in humans, those have the strongest evidence of an association with breast cancer. And then uh, there are some pharmaceuticals, griseofulvin, furosemide, metronidazole, um, some uh, chemicals that are in um, meat, and particularly in cooked or charred meat, uh, disruption of sleep, um, a sterilant uh, called ethylene oxide, which um, actually the major exposure is around manufacturing facilities where that's used to produce uh, other chemicals. PAHs, those are products of combustion or um, soot, smoke, uh, pollution, air pollution, vehicle exhaust. Um, PCBs are uh, industrial chemicals from, they're very persistent. They were um, banned in the 70s, but they're still around, and particularly in fish, and dioxin. So those are all exposures where um, people have been able to do uh, studies in humans and see some associations. And then we don't, there's some other pharmaceuticals, endomethacin and nitrofurantoin that didn't show associations. Also, um, many uh, epi studies, many human studies that looked at the DDE, the metabolite of DDT, 
and they um, they uh, looked at just adult exposure. They did not see associations with breast cancer. That's um, and that's that's interesting and important um, that with DDT, the parent compound in early life, you do see an association with breast cancer, but with DDE. You um, in you looking only at adult exposure, you don't, and 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 uh, it gives us some clues about the importance of early life uh, exposure. Um, similarly, PCBs in the general population and especially later in life don't show an association with breast cancer, but early in life you you do see some association. So um, by by sort of dissecting these um, associations, we get some. Uh, some uh, information about the about the, the, the fact that these 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 influences of these chemicals maybe are very important from early in life. Um, I often uh, I find it sometimes hard to for, I think it's hard for people to understand how why it's so difficult to make an association between. Um, and environmental exposure and uh, and cancer and so in order to make that association you have to study a very large group of people like in the thousands of people um, and you have to know about their exposure in a systematic way across all of them and you have to know about their whether they got the, the cancer or not also in a systematic way across all the people most of the known human chemical carcinogens have been discovered in studies of workers, occupational exposures. But almost all, of, most of those studies were, were in men. And so they actually haven't provided very much information about breast cancer and chemicals. And so uh, I'd say we have, um, you know, less, less data on on chemicals and breast cancer than we do, for example, uh, for chemicals and leukemia, uh, because leukemia was easier to study in these big cohorts of um, occupationally exposed uh, men. Um, so breast cancer is, uh, it's influenced in many stages of life, as I mentioned, and like diethylstilbestrol, uh, shows that, um, which, which was a hormone that was given to pregnant women, and those, those women um, uh, had an increased breast cancer risk themselves from the exposure during their pregnancy. But their daughters also had an increased risk of breast cancer 60 years later. So um, we know that hormonal exposure early in life or during pu puberty and during pregnancy when the breast is going through many changes um, can uh, can increase breast cancer risk. Uh, I mentioned uh, this diethylstilbestrol, which was prescribed to pregnant women in the 40s to the 60s, and the it took 60 years um, to prove essentially that 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 exposure in during in in utero affected the breast cancer risk in the in the offspring, and that it's really good evidence of why. Uh, why we have to, we, we can't just rely on human studies, but we have to actually go to experimental uh, studies <clears throat> in the laboratory in order to uh, figure out what chemicals are um, we need to um, avoid and which chemicals might be safer. Uh, the, 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 basically most of the work that I've been talking about so far is um, in this, what I'll call the cancer world. This is most of the research, like biomedical research is happening in looking at, looking at the at treatments for diseases, looking at the, what is the disease state and how can we fix it? And the public health side of that um, is focused on cancer prevention, screening, uh, smoking, um, diet, the studies of the, those, those kinds of factors. Um, and that's all mostly done in human studies. But in this upstream, in this chemical world, when people are trying to make decisions about 
hey, I'm making this, you know, I'm making this floor polish. Uh, what chemicals should I put in it? Are they safe? Uh, that world is going from sort of chemical to biological effects and sometimes all the way to disease. And it's using mostly predictive tools, whether it's cells in a dish or uh, animal studies in a laboratory. And very uh, much rare, much more rare to use, uh, to think, to use human studies in this um, sort of study of, in chemical decision-making and the toxicology that we do to, uh, to make decisions and predictions about health effects. And what Silent Spring has done is start at the disease of breast cancer and then look upstream and say, how can we, what biological effects precede the disease and lead to it? And what chemicals cause those biological effects and what exposures, where do we get exposures to those chemicals? And so that is, um, that's an unusual sort of shift in perspective and um, it could, uh, I think it's been actually very fruitful um, for breast cancer and could be, I think, similarly uh, extended to other cancers and, and even to other health effects. So we have studied uh, many, um, we've, done a, we've done a lot of work to try to say, well, okay, so based on everything that we know about breast cancer, what kind of chemicals what chemicals do we know that affect these biological processes uh, that are gonna um, affect breast cancer risk? And in vitro, that means cells in a dish. So we do some, um, we can use data from those kinds of studies. We can use uh, rodent models. And to some extent, as I've discussed, we can talk about epidemiology. So one, we've identified about 216 chemicals that cause uh, mammary gland tumors in, in rodents. So those are high priority to look at uh, as, as sus suspected breast carcinogens in our view. Um, we've identified about 30 chemicals that alter mammary gland development and that can change susceptibility of the gland to carcinogens later. But the only reason that number is so small, 30 chemicals, is that that kind of um, testing to look at how a chemical exposure early in life affects mammary gland development isn't really done for most chemicals. It's hardly ever done. Um, and that's actually another thing that we feel is very important is to try to, in, in, is to try to and make sure that the chemical regulatory programs, when they test it, they also look for things like these effects on the mammary gland. Um, we have also um, published a couple of articles trying to identify ways to use this, use information about these biological mechanisms to breast cancer and, and integrate them into a way to identify well uh, more easily what chemicals might cause breast cancer. Um, and we've done some major reviews of epi studies on environment and breast cancer and sort of synthesized that data. So, um, this has been a very big focus of Silent Springs' work is to just to try to figure out, hey, what, which chemicals uh, should we be focused on in terms of breast cancer and how can we identify chemicals that might cause breast cancer? Um, and one of the things that we can see is that this sort of parallel on the left is these established breast cancer risk factors like reproductive factors, prescription hormones, alcohol, ionizing radiation, and tobacco smoke. And if you look at the chemicals um, from, um, that cause mammary gland tumors in animal models, for example, you can see um, uh, that there are a lot of parallels. So reproductive factors and prescription hormones are related to hormone exposure. And there are many chemicals in the environment that are hormonally active, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so you can see uh, it's reasonable, I think, and uh, plausible to say, well, in, Endocrine disruptors can also um, uh, can also probably do the same things that prescription hormones can do. They, uh, we can see that they do similar things in you know in the lab. Um, alcohol is essentially a solvent, and we see that many solvents are rodent mammary carcinogens, and uh, that 
even there is some epi data supporting the, the solvent findings specifically in, in humans. So, so we're look, take a very careful look at, um, at solvents and are uh, concerned about uh, regulating them and making sure uh, that people don't get exposed um, to them. Uh, ionizing radiation damages DNA and causes uh, reactive oxygen stress and and genotoxicants, many chemicals that damage DNA. Well, they would be expected to affect you know to, to affect breast cancer in the same way. So, um, and tobacco smoke and other air pollutants have PAHs in common, and so so these um, these parallels give us more confidence that the rodent mammary carcinogens are good predictors and that chemicals that cause those those tumors or that even that um, have other sort of chemical parallels to these established factors that those are going to also be su suspect breast carcinogens and this table that we, we showed before I've added um, a column now showing if there's supportive evidence for the finding in humans in in animals and so we can see for most of these there is very consistent um, evidence between humans and and animals uh, where so, which so so that's um, it's important this is an important uh, finding because uh, there are I'll often hear um, criticism that, oh, well, what you find in the animals isn't relevant to humans. It's often not predictive. And certainly there are some, uh, some uh, limitations, but it's uh, uh, what we, we can see right here that, that, there are, um, that they're basically consistent. And there are other studies that show that basically any, anything that's been shown to be uh, carcinogenic in humans also is carcinogenic in the rodents. Um, and uh, the question is, um, is more the reverse is, are there many more things carcinogenic to the rodents than to the, you know, than to the humans? And um, I'd say that's not clear, but it's, but, but it certainly is a warning sign when you see that something uh, causes cancer in, uh, in animals. So part of the um, one thing that's happening in the field of cancer, so ca cancer used to be a carcinogen was just something that damaged DNA. And, that, and then um, it was sort of expanded to something that damages DNA or something that causes cells to proliferate and grow. And then it was expanded even further to say, oh, well, with these hormonal cancers, you can have changes during development, exposures during development like DES that can um, affect cancer later on. And now um, that's uh, gone even sort of um, broader where uh, um, there are many researchers are saying, well, there are actually many, um, many factors besides genotoxicity, which is over there on the right, about halfway down, many factors other than um, and proliferation, which is um, over on the left uh, at the same level of genotoxicity. Um, there are actually many other um, characteristics of uh, chemicals that cause cancer. And, and, and in this slide, I'm focusing on breast cancer. Um, so we know that it, starting on the upper left, if you have immune system suppression, then you uh, increase, you increase cancer uh, Incidents. So, any any chemical exposure that suppresses your immune function, uh, maybe that can be considered a carcinogen as well, or a chemical that will increase your risk of uh, cancer. Um, chemicals or uh, that factors that in, in influence inflammation and um, and oxidative stress uh, also are associated with carcinogenesis. Uh, steroid hormones, uh, because they can affect development of tissues and, and also growth and proliferation in tissues are associated with carcinogenesis. Um, xenobiotic metabolism is uh, referring uh, to chemicals that will alter um, 
So we have a lot of enzymes in our bodies that when we get exposed to chemicals or when we eat things, um, the, those enzymes break the chemicals down. Uh, sometimes the same, sometimes, and chemicals are induced by exposure. So if you get exposed to a lot of um, air pollution, you'll um, have uh, certain enzymes will be more abundant in your body in order to, to try to break that down. Uh, but sometimes those, those changes will also affect, for example, hormone metabolism or hormone uh, um, uh, synthesis, either one. And so that's another way that, um, that you can have a chemical exposure that affects uh, a hormonally related cancer. Um, angiogenesis is uh, a, a chemical that affects uh, development of blood vessels and blood flow. Apoptosis is a uh, programmed cell death. So cells are, tissues are very orderly places. The cells are supposed to be, you know, in line in a certain place when they're not supposed to be too many cells there. And um, they uh, talk to each other and um, keep each other essentially like with peer pressure sort of behaving the right way. Um, apoptosis is when, you know, they are like, like we need you to, um, we need you to destroy your, you know, destroy yourself now. And, and if you have interference with that process, that's definitely associated with cancer. And um, same thing with cell cycle control. Uh, epigenetics is sort of um, about uh, exposures that can alter the um, alter the the DNA so that certain genes will be expressed or not expressed. Um, and then and that, that can affect the, essentially the biology and the tissue. Genotoxicity, which is DNA damage, growth hormones, and, and the immortalization. So, so now there's this much broader way of thinking about carcinogens and um, any chemicals that can do any of these things might be considered suspect carcinogens. And, Chemicals that do many of these things would, you know, definitely be uh, suspect carcinogens. And many of the known carcinogens do more than one. They do multiple of these um, sort of actions. Uh, these, this is essentially another way that, that those same types of bio biology, biological characteristics are. But here they're represented at different levels of organization. So some of them are um, cellular and molecular. That's the level that I was mostly talking about in the last slide. But you can see um, other effects. So chemicals that would affect on the tissue level, um, uh, altered mammary gland development or um, uh, increased breast density or um, causing hyperplasia or proliferation in the breast tissue. That, that would be uh, potentially associated with breast cancer. And then factors that affect the susceptibility of the, of the host, the woman um, or man who is affected by uh, the, the breast cancer, um, what, what are factors that make her or him more susceptible, uh, whether it's um, early onset of breast development or um, uh, genetic factors or other factors that can um, that can make um, that can make you more more susceptible so so there are many sort of levels at which chemicals can affect your uh, susceptibility to cancer um, so we focused on uh, chemicals that are carcinogenic or hormone disruptors um, for the most part, and looking at their, um, and, and now I'm going to sort of switch to talking about exposure and what do we know about exposure and, and what people, how people can reduce exposure. Um, so met the, the chemicals that we've identified as sort of acting um, on one of these breast cancer processes include some, some common chemicals uh, like air pollution, and um, these perfluorinated chemicals that are linings in fast food wrappers, some uh, chemicals and preservatives in makeup, uh, some phthalates that are in plastics and some pesticides. Um, here are examples of some chemicals that we've 
that, that cause uh, mammary tumors in, in animal studies. So gasoline, benzene in particular in gasoline, auto exhaust and air pollution, um, paint remover and solvents that talked about, uh, certain flame retardants that are used in furniture uh, to, um, that, uh, that are carcinogenic, um, some pesticides, water uh, disinfection byproducts. So um, water disinfection is important to kill bacteria and make sure we don't all get sick. But chlorination um, is a, produces some byproducts. Some of those byproducts are really quite uh, genotoxic and um, it would be, it would be, um, it hasn't been studied so much in relation to breast cancer, but I think it's you know worth um, thinking about whether there are ways to reduce those disinfection byproducts. And uh, a lot of um, interest there would be in um, uh, I think um, I think that the you get these disinfection byproducts as a combination of the chlorination and also how much, um, essentially how polluted uh, with, um, with organic material the, the, uh, the water is when you start off. So, uh, so protecting watersheds and keeping the water clean and looking at the disinfection uh, uh, methods are both approaches to reduce those. And then nonstick coatings, um, like I talked about on the food wrappers, uh, have um, these perfluorinated chemicals, some of them, have shown memory tumors. And then um, endocrine disruptors are, I'd say, more widespread and, um, and, and an important factor with these uh, chemicals too is that they can act together. So they might be very weak estrogens on their own, for example, but they uh, can mimic estrogen, but but they're sort of much weaker than our endogenous estrogen, but they can act additively when you combine them. And so uh, it's very difficult to prove that any one might cause breast cancer, but it seems very uh, plausible that um, exposure to many, many estrogenic chemicals or endocrine disruptors uh, could, in could increase breast cancer risk. So, so some endocrine active chemicals include chemicals in, in pesticides and food packaging, some laundry detergent constituents, cosmetics, preservatives, uh, fragrances, plastics, sunscreen, furniture foam, and disinfectants. Uh, now we did some, some big exposure studies, uh, including on Cape Cod and uh, starting on Cape Cod, I'd say, where we looked at to say, well, how, where are these endocrine disruptors, these chemicals that are so common indoors, where are they, um, how, how much is in people's houses, how much is in people's bodies? And we looked for 89 uh, different chemicals in 120 homes and uh, we found, you know, about 20 chemicals per home. Altogether, we found 67 endocrine disruptors, including 27 different pesticides. DDT was in two thirds of the homes, even though it was banned, you know, 30 years ago. Um, phthalates, which are plasticizers, were abundant. Parabens, uh, alkyl phenols, or some other common endocrine disruptors. Flame retardant levels were very high and much higher than in Europe. Um, Several chemicals were above um, sign of EPA health-based guidelines, and many didn't have any guidelines. Uh, most homes had something above a health guideline, and so that was um, that was really remarkable. And uh, I think it was a very influential paper that actually has shifted EPA uh, EPA's thinking about exposure and um, to to focus on, uh, um, to realize that, so EPA had been very focused on outdoor exposure and the shift is to go um, and to, to realize that actually people's uh, exposures in their bodies if based on blood or urine testing is, is most 
affected by chemicals that are in consumer products more so even than chemicals that are you know sort of traditional outdoors or um, smokestack pollutants with the exception of auto exhaust which of course is ubiquitous uh, then we went over to california and we did um, some some more um, exposure sampling and there we really discovered that the flame retardant levels in california were extremely high much higher than we had found on the cape higher than other people had reported in in the u.s and much higher than had been reported in europe and we looked at blood levels for these flame retardants in california and found them to be uh, twice as high as um, the rest of the u.s and attributed that to a, a, a furniture standard in, Cal, in California that required um, essentially, it, it didn't require the use of these flame retardants, but it was the way that it was worded. This was the main, this was the way that the companies could comply with the standard was to put these toxic chemicals in there. Um, and, and when these chemicals were banned, um, the the companies actually switched to another chemical which was um which was carcinogenic and known to be carcinogenic so that was very um that was distressing because it was it was it was already known that that was a carcinogenic chemical and that the, the problem of substituting a, a chemical that's toxic with another chemical that's toxic just uh, to avoid regulation is, you know, really something we've got to address on a policy level. Um, now, our results and the work working with many other activists and um, and advocates and um, attorneys managed to actually uh, change both the market, um, which is making a demand for um, for furniture that's safer and and doesn't have these toxic flame retardants, also change the regulation. So. It made it possible for uh, furniture makers to produce um, to produce furniture that didn't uh, include that didn't have this the flame retardant chemicals and it and it and to label it and, and that they had, they could label it so that the consumer would be able to tell if they were buying a couch that had toxic flame retardant chemicals or not. So um, so that was a very um, a satisfying uh, change. Uh, that you know coming out of um, the work uh, we've also been looking at flame retardant exposures in college dorms and specifically um, comparing a campus that is meeting two different um, sort of regulatory requirements and seeing which ones have the highest flame retardants and that based on these results um, we found that the campus that was meeting this what's called TB133 uh, requirements for their, all their furniture. The, that furniture had a lot more flame retardants in it and the, and the dust in the dorms also had a lot more flame retardants in it. Um, and so um, we've, actually, we've actually been able to um, work in Boston to change the requirements for public spaces so that this they don't have to meet this TB133 standard, um, which is uh, causing um, causing a high uh, level, high use of these toxic flame retardant chemicals, um, but that they can meet a, a, a different standard, TB117, um, that has uh, uh, doesn't doesn't produce as much flame retardant. Uh, we also have looked at consumer products and most recently at hair, hair products that are uh, marketed to, um, to black women in the U.S. And uh, we did find, you know, both for the general population and um, particularly in this set of products that there are quite a, a, a broad set of chemicals that are um, known to be endocrine disruptors or have other um, toxicity, including uh, some of them as uh, associated with asthma. So um, we wanted to uh, just to remember that when when um, 
prevention is realistic, a realistic goal that when women went off of hormone replacement therapy after the, um, in 2000, after uh, the Women's Health Initiative showed that the risks exceeded the benefits, um, like many, many women stopped taking hormone replacement therapy and you can actually see the breast cancer rates in the population uh, decline at that uh, point in, among older women who were taking HRT and then it stayed steady among younger women. And, and econo you know, the economics of prevention are, are very dramatic. In this particular scenario, they, um, I think they looked at 10 years of data and um, they said that because of this Women's Health Initiative and women going off HRT, there were 4.3 million fewer people using, women using hormone therapy 126,000 fewer breast cancer cases and a medical expenditure savings of $35 billion. So, wow, um, there, there's a lot, a lot is possible. And so our sort of framework here is that this cancer prevention science is that we look for the biological mechanism and chemicals that have a mechanism that is, uh, you know, plausibly related to breast cancer and then we look at human exposure, and if you have both of those things, then you have a basis for some kind of action, whether it's educating or regulating or reformulating to, to make safer products. Um, if you're interested in um, how to, how to t sort of uh, reduce your own exposures, we've developed a smartphone app called Detox Me that is free, that uh, where we've tried to put all of everything we've learned in uh, 20 years of research on this topic and, um, and uh, in, into, uh, you know, into a package that helps people figure out what they can do, um, both on an individual level and also um, by talking to um, manufacturers and policymakers. So for example, some tips might be to replace a vinyl shower curtain that has phthalates with quick drying nylon, to look for paraben, phthalate, and fragrance-free products, eat fresh foods because packaged foods and restaurant foods we found tend to produce uh, more exposures. Um, keep dust levels low with a damp cloth or vacuum with a HEPA filter because there are a lot of um, chemicals in household dust. They sort of stick there. Uh, and to uh, avoid products advertised as stain resistant, or I would say also as antibacterial. Um, and there are many, many more tips like this in, uh, in the app. I really love, um, for each of the uh, categories, so they have children, home, food and drink, cleaning, personal care. And so within each of those categories, there's a little uh, top 10 list of the top 10 tips. That's sort of my, my favorite um, part of the app. Um, and um, we've also, uh, over the last year, uh, year and a half or so, we've done um, a crowdsourced biomonitoring study where um, we're, uh, we, we wanted to study and, 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 and learn more about how people can reduce exposures and what's, what are effective ways to reduce exposures. And so, in this uh, case, people uh, pay and they send in their urine samples. We analyze them for about 10 or 12 different endocrine disruptors that are in consumer products. And if people fill out a questionnaire when they're doing their sample about their behaviors and product use, and we're analyzing that data now, we've had over 800 people in the study. So it's, we're very excited about what we'll be able to, uh, to, to find. Uh, and with that, I want to close and open for questions. and. Um, Thank uh, that Mass Breast Cancer Coalition for their vision in, you know, 20 years ago uh, plus now in in founding Silent Spring and in understanding the importance and the opportunities for prevention. I really think there are um, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, to prevent the a lot these exposures are are common and there's just not very many. It's not that much attention focused on. Uh, trying to avoid them, and, so, uh, and it can be, it can be, you know, relatively easy to avoid some of them. So, thank you. Thank you, Ruthann. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, first one, the question really is, can I reverse my exposure effects? 
So, you know, if I'm, if, as, as the uh, audience member put it, if I'm getting up there in age, is it too late? Or if I work to reduce my exposures now, does the research show that it will make a difference? <coughs> well, that's a great question. So, um, you know, because of all this, uh, because of everything we know about breast cancer, uh, the, um, for, you know, one, one, one of the biological mechanisms that I was talking about is about cell proliferation. What keeps it, what keeps the cells in the tumor or in the breast um, dividing, even when they shouldn't divide? Or are there, is there too much hormone signal? And that's the, you know, that's the basis of tamoxifen treatment is to try to block the estrogen. Uh, or, and, um, uh, and, and in order to prevent that. And, and hormone replacement therapy, on the other hand, it in, increased it within the five years, um, uh, within five years of diagnosis. So, um, and, and then, and you can see it, right, um, in fact, in this uh, graph where 2000, where that arrow is on the bottom, that's when uh, the study came out that started um, you know, uh, having people, so people in response to that, people stopped taking HRT, and you can see that the drop went down actually right away. Um, so uh, for, and, and I think for immune effects, I think for many of those mechanisms, uh, absolutely, even, um, even after a diagnosis, uh, you can um, improve your chances by minimizing some of those characteristics, whether it's like cell division, oxidative stress, or inflammation. Um, and improving your immune function, all of those things are gonna, um, should be helpful. Okay, good. And a question about gender. Of course, when you think of breast cancer, you, most, you, you automatically think of women, but men do get best with breast cancer as well. So when you're looking at the risk factors, is there a difference by gender? Um, there, um, there's, there's, um, there are many parallels, uh, since the hormone like trajectory for men is very different than for women, that part is different. Um, but, uh, I know that we've seen breast cancers in males for some of these same kinds of exposures that we are focused on uh, because they cause mammary carcinogens in rodents. And it, I think that includes um, for like auto exhaust and uh, I believe ga like gasoline and solvents. So, uh, so I think there definitely are, are parallels, but um, men don't have as much estrogen and their tumors aren't really um, uh, as I think as, um, responsive to it. Okay. Um, someone asked, they wanted to follow up on the study that you had done um, looking at hair care products for black women. Do you see um, other situations with um, other um, racial groups? Do you see them, you know, Asian women or Hispanic women? Do you see differences in um, the hormone disruptors? Mm, that's a, um, well, there are, uh, there are differences in exposures to, uh, common consumer product chemicals. Um, the, a good way to look at that is through the Centers for Disease Control, CDC's, um, NHANES data, data set. So they do a, uh, sampling of the U.S. population every year. And they um, um, they will um, uh, they measure about two hundred different chemicals, and they oversample um, specific ethnic subgroups in order to try to develop representative data for those groups. And so, so you can uh, at a minimum compare, I think, uh, Mexican American, non-Hispanic, Black. Uh, white, by genders and ages, 
And, and so when you do that, you can absolutely see, it depends on which chemical uh, you're looking at, but you can certainly see different patterns of exposure in, uh, in all, based on all of those demographic types of characteristics. Okay, thank you. Well, Ruthann, I, I want to thank you so much for the information that you've provided us with today. Um, I want to say that on behalf of our um, executive director, Cheryl Osimo, and NBCC's board of directors, um, thank you for being here and to our listening audience. I appreciate you taking the time out to join us today. For those interested, the recording of this webinar will be available on MBCC's website by 6 p.m. So I thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks to everybody who uh, listened. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good afternoon. Yeah.